Well, good morning, golfers. Uh, time for another Better Golf with Kevin and Jake Haim. Uh, great weekend uh, of golf behind us. And our podcast is a little different than many because we're going to teach you how to play. We're both PG of Canada professionals. I've been doing radio for 25 years, teaching for 30 years. Jake, uh, uh, you've been now living it your entire life, 27 years old. What would you think of our weekend? It was a great weekend. I was pleasantly surprised by the FedEx Cup. I think, you know, we were talking about doing a driver show today because it became so important, especially in the final round. But uh, I thought I actually I was pleasantly surprised with how the FedEx Cup turned out. And I'm happy for Rory. Yeah, I wasn't. I think I think the PGA Tour is off the mark with this whole end it earlier and make it all about the money thing. But we'll talk about that. But you're right. The, the, the main emphasis on the show today is driver. Uh, Brooke Henderson had a great weekend at the CP, almost defending. And uh, is maybe the, the the greatest driver in the women's game right now. Uh, when you combine athleticism and power uh, and accuracy, right? Uh, pound for pound, she most certainly is. And then Rory McIlroy, the same. You've met Rory. I've met Rory. That guy's tiny. I've seen him in person many times. He's tiny. And he's, he's bombing it out there 350 yards. So we're going to talk today about what's important to hit your driver and how important it is. And I think we saw, we've seen with these two that uh, when they're on and really firing that driver, they're almost unbeatable. And it, it, that club is that important in your game. So we'll talk about that today. Yeah, scores can go really low. As well as the CP and Brooke Henderson and Jin Young Ko, who was very impressive this week. Zero bogeys in a tournament. And we'll talk about uh, the FedEx Cup a little bit and the Tour Championship and what you think about it. So, so l- let me ask you right there. So you said, oh, it was a great weekend, and I'm happy for Rory. And Does that mean you like what they've done here ending in, the, in August and making it all about money? And like, I don't like any of that. Well, uh, sh- so I'll agree with those two points. The money doesn't compel me as much as they intend to compel me, but I've resigned the fact. That that is not meant for me. It's meant for the general public, right? The, I agree with what Rory said at the start of the week, which is if you're looking for this to be a legacy event, then you shouldn't be starting people at different numbers at the start. Right? That's why Rory, even in his press conference after, kept talking about how he was just trying to win the tournament to par, right? Jokingly. Which he did. That's why he made that putt on the last hole. That was to win the event in his Except mind. Except he was, yeah, he was 13 under and Xander was 10. The joke I've seen going around Twitter is that Rory won the net and the gross. But... Uh, you know, I think that I do agree with that point. That doesn't make it a legacy event, the money. However, the FedEx Cup is not a legacy event like the majors. It's an entertainment product. It is a pure They're trying to make it that, Jake. Entertainment product. They're trying to make it that. Uh, they're trying to make it like they're trying to make the players championship. The irony of this whole thing is, is that Rory won their two big events, the yes. players championship. And everyone's still going to vote for Brooks Kepka as player of the year because he won two majors. So if the if the he play won one major, pardon, he won one major this year. He only won one this year. He won one and he came top four in all the other ones. He came T two at the Masters, uh, T two at the U.S. Oh, Open, right. fourth the at the Open. British, and he yeah. won the. Uh, he the, didn't win the U.S. Open. Yeah. That's right. But still, your point stands, and I've been you no, know. No, I don't know if they're gonna uh, vote for him then. So I, I'm off the mark there. Yeah, I don't know if they're gonna vote for. But so, the long and the short of what I'm saying is this: I think that they're whether it's for. All golf fans are not. They're making this a pure entertainment shootout. And from that capacity, I was more entertained than I thought it would be. Now, maybe it's because it was Rory and Brooks in the final round, and I'm a big Rory fan, but I was pleasantly surprised with what they're trying to give us, what they gave us. I don't love the schedule change now that it's done. It does seem early. I'm not worried it's going to affect the golf season like I've, you know, we've talked about in the past. Now that I'm here, I mean, it's just watching golf. I don't think it's going to affect how players yeah, it takes the, energy. the general public. You might be right there. I mean, I, I'm thinking what selling clubs, fitting clubs, it just artificially ends the season. It's like school ends and then summer camps start. It's a turning of a page to a certain degree in golf. Now they're talking about, I guess they don't call them si- silly season events anymore because they're they're playing. It's an actual 20, you know, 19, 20, 20 season yeah. event. Yeah, but it's a wraparound event. People really you know, click their brains off now, I think, when it comes to really being engaged with golf and making your weekend about watching it and maybe go hit some balls in the morning and then yeah. watch the event in the afternoon. I, I don't think it's helpful. However, I've been thinking about this for a little while now because we've proposed this topic together off air, right? And I don't think people don't play football when football's not on. I don't think people don't play hockey when hockey's not on. Yeah. 
So if I do believe that inherently, I have to believe that's the same for golf. I'm not, it's not helpful for the industry to be done this early. I do agree with you on that point completely. But if you're going to have a tournament that has a $15 million bonus on the end and is based on this entire playoff system, this is more like playoffs than traditional FedEx Cup has been. This is more of a playoff style event. Do I think it's a little silly to have everyone staggered on the first tee? Yes. Was I entertained by it? Much more than I thought, which is why I think that uh, I'm I, pleasantly surprised. I also, I also think the money thing is actually insulting to some people. I, I, You know, to me, the greatest trophy to win in sports is the Stanley Cup. And the stories are famous about players having dislocated shoulders and playing on broken ankles. And, I mean, you do anything to win. That's, that's what engages people. Making history, doing things other people can't do, and giving it your all. This is what sports is about. Agreed. And the Stanley Cup does that. No one knows how much the Masters purse is. I mean, I, I guess you can look it up and hunt, but they never talk about the money. Uh, no one talks about how much player in the Super Bowl wins on the winning team. Except all we talk about is their salaries. So... I, I oh, that's that not true for me. That's not true for me okay, at all. As but a matter of fact, for the general salaries public. have have single handedly turned me off baseball. I, I am not interested in a two hundred and fifty two million dollar. Uh, and, and you know what? Uh, I'm a, I'm a edge edge of the Raptor fan at best. I'm not a big basketball fan, but uh, you know, being all about the money and is he going to resign and. It, it turns me off the sport. I know, it but really lots of sports does. fans, it doesn't, right? If you think of the fantasy players and most at most casual fans of sports. So they're making it all about money and gambling? and Well, it's not making it all about that, but that is a big factor in it. And I would argue that there is a group of players on the PGA Tour that are underpaid. If you look at Rory, Brooks, DJ, proportionally to the draw they bring into the sport and what they win in the sport, they are underpaid. I don't care. Okay, so but what the FedEx Cup is is a redistribution of that money, right? Rory signed a two hundred plus million yes, dollar contract with Nike. Money. I'm not saying he needs the but money. But that's the, but my point. Why are they making it about the money? Because nobody cares if Rory makes more money. Brooks Kepka didn't even look to interested in his last putt. It was for a million dollars to tie Xander Shoffley, I think. And he didn't even look that interested in, in reading it from both angles. He just lagged it up there and tapped it in. So these guys have so much money. Agreed. Except I've all week been asking people what they think of this. And people have no clue as casual fans, what do you think of this? And more than 50% of them have said, that's kind of interesting. Huh. I'd like to see them putt for $15 million. So I think what I, what I said at the start and what I'm going to stand by is this isn't for us. The diehard golf fans are not going to prioritize this over the majors. It's not the same legacy thing. I'm not saying this is nearly as big as the Does majors. Does any part of you think that someone who works... 50 hour weeks and makes $50,000 a year will be maybe turned off by no. this. No, because they'd be turned off by every sport and the majority of people obsess over the team sports where the guys get contracts and they can frankly play like garbage and still earn their contract. You're getting predictive. This is at least honorable. This is at least you have to go win the money. You don't get predicted that you're going to make the team. Well, this much it, money is, a yeah, it, it's a it is a bonus pool. Yeah, it is a bonus pool. You it's a bonus. You don't even have to play that great this week. You just had a good year, and like sure, Dustin Johnson play played year. like a dog this week. Okay, but think of all the so we're Ottawa Senators fans. Think of all the players in the Ottawa Senators that had a dog of a year this year. The team was awful. I'd argue many of the players look checked out, but they still get their contracts. So yeah, but it doesn't make me to to, to use a bad system in another sport to to quantify your argument for this sport isn't isn't really selling me it's just saying yeah that's bad too well hold on i'm not saying that i like the fact that they're dispensing the money and that makes me more interested the money has nothing to do i just with think the pga tour so now uh, i'll be turning my attention you got these small events here granted the events in europe aren't that big a deal but the bmw championships coming up um, there's a world golf championship the race to dubai i'll be interested in Absolutely. i'll be watching the european tour now yes so you got two arguments this might be an off season, and then we'll be rabid to watch it again in the spring. And you know, the players want an off season. Everybody wants an off season. Yeah, well, they do need time to rest, and it was getting very long for. That's one golf. argument. Yeah. The other argument is that they're they're folding up their tent and going home while people are still playing golf and into golf, and 
and want to be part of golf and around golf. So, you know, anyway, I, I, I don't like making it about the money, and I don't like ending the season artificially early. So I, I think it's two strikes on the PGA Tour. Now, may I change my mind four years from now? I'm not drawing a line in the sand here and being really adamant no, about it. of course it. Not. I just... You know, it looked like another tournament. It's just like you can't tell me Shane Lowry coming up in the Open Championship wasn't way more, or Tiger winning the, the Masters. Way bigger deal to me. Or Gary Woodland yeah. hitting that shot in 15. How did I think, how the heck did I think Kepka won too? Because I'm just rhyming off the majors here. Gary Woodland hit that shot into, was it 15, the par 5, that 3-wood to win that event, and how dominant Kepka was at Bethpage. I mean, that to me... It, you know, I watched live from. It was interesting, right? The Golf Channel didn't even have live from from the Tour Championship. No Frank Nabilo, no essays with that Rich Lerner. I didn't think about that. No Brandel right. Chambly. Yeah. Y- you know, I, I just, anyway. Uh, I mean, the, I'll tell you, there are things. In general, I love what the PGA Tour does. They give a lot of money to charity. Uh, they're connected to communities. Uh, most of the guys are really good guys. I mean, I think compared to what maybe other sports do where it's, gimme 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 and you know they're, they're, they don't have the same soul as the PJ tour has as an entity but i just i'm not sure that this is ever going to uh capture me yeah so before we move on by the way to the next topic away from the format itself i actually agree with most of what you're saying i am not sitting here making an argument that the majors are less important than this or this is even close to as important as the majors to me it is not the same thing however if I categorize in my brain of it's not as big a deal at the majors, but it's pure entertainment, was I entertained? I was more entertained than Who's I thought. Who's the player I would be. of the year? It's got to be Rory. He won the players and the tour championship. So, to counter the exact argument we just had, I'm not ready to not call Brooks, though, because of his top fives in every major. So, here's where I'm not sure how I feel. I've been thinking about it all night because I was talking to Duncan, who's one of our oh, teaching coaches here about sleep, it yesterday. Kid. It's not that important. Well, not literally all night. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I slept plenty fine. But, um,. I've been thinking about this because Rory won the players. He had the most top tens on tour. He had the best scoring average. He had the most strokes gained. And the only other player that's had more strokes gained was Tiger's 2006, 2008, 2009 season. Tiger's was, or Rory was 2.55 strokes gained on the field, which is the second best player since it's been recorded in 2004. Yep. So. From all of it's those metrics, be him. it has to be him. He was the best player this year. I think the Open Championship hurt him a lot in people's minds as far as was it a great year. And he didn't say it yesterday, but he's got to be thinking it. He missed the cut at his home course in yeah. the Open Championship. Uh, that is a giant pimple on his nose. Agreed. You know, uh, anyway. So apart from that, so from that argument, I think there's a very compelling argument that it should be Rory from all of those metrics. Then Brooks Kepka came first, second, second, fourth in the majors. Any other year, that is a sweep of a player of the year. Yeah. So the honest answer is I don't think there's a wrong answer, but it'll be very interesting to see what if everybody, the players how everybody vote comes for Brooks. To. It means the money and the. You know, they say the players is a major and the money is a big deal in the FedEx Cup. If they all vote for Brooks, it tells you that they don't feel that way, right? If the yes. players do. Agreed. Uh, Brooke Henderson in Canada. Amazing. I, I, I'd like to say a little bit, you know, we almost expect her to, to win. She did what Mike Weir couldn't do and no one could do since 1945 or something when Pat Fletcher won the Canadian Open. Uh, I guess... Uh, you know, the idea of winning the Canadian Open, the name, the Canadian Open, and, and getting it done. But it was a good week for her. It was I a mean, very good week for her. And, and I want to emphasize how difficult a week, how difficult it is right now for Brooke to focus on practice and her time and her schedule. I mean, we have her here at our event every year, which is another thing that pulls at her. And there are so many of those. Uh, I watch Bob Weeks walk up the fairway interviewing her during a pro-am where guys paid $45,000 to play nine holes with her and she's signing autographs as she's walking up the fairway and I mean for her to get a little quiet time to go practice especially this week especially this week that's what I'm saying repeating that win is so tough and uh, she had an amazing week just you know getting up there and the other thing is the draw I mean Toronto is a market 
you can't get people to come out and watch the Canadian Open. You can't get people to come out and watch anything in Toronto. They came to watch. Her her yeah. draw in Canada is amazing. Her draw as an athlete, not only with little girl golfers, but with everybody. It's, no, it's, it's a fascinating thing to watch. Her her true, pure, small town Canada. I love to play golf and being a good person and everything. It just shines through there. It's really neat. Yeah, and she's fun to watch. Let's not put that aside. It's not just that. Is the way she plays the game is fun to watch. If she was statistically a better putter and maybe a little tighter around the green, of which both she can do great but is a little inconsistent, she might be the best player on the Yeah, team. how much money was she playing for this week? No clue. No one cares. No clue. Yeah. Although, did you hear the Aeon Risk Reward thing for the PG LPGA, just as a quick aside? So they're doing the same thing on the LPGA that they did on the PGA this year, where there's dedicated holes, and your scoring average on those dedicated holes is uh, worth a million dollars. Okay. So a girl this week on 14, she withdrew on Saturday because on 14 she made a nine. She cited hip injury, but that was the Aeon Risk Reward charge, and she's in the lead. So it would have blown her lead. She pulled out her score got nullified and she's still up for the million dollars mm. so apparently she had a pretty severe hip injury and probably made the nine because of the hip injury if it was that bad but it's just kind of a funny thing to look at that is funny but i don't think brooke plays for money i don't i don't no. think any great player plays for money I no really and, don't. and you know what so that might also be why brooks didn't care on the last hole he's made his money he's not playing for the money at that point yeah. he's lost a term he doesn't care and you know i do think i know we're going back to the fedex cup for a second but some of those players, the money got to them. You look at that last round, a couple of them were shaky. I think some of them were nervous over the money. But when it comes to great players like Rory and Brooks and Brooke Henderson, and so really much. good players, they're there about the prestige and the title more than anything because they know the money's going to come at some point, right? You know what? Uh, Brooks gets in his Mercedes you know, car he's been given for the week, and he goes to the Ritz-Carlton and checks out of the suite, and he gets on his net jet flight. And he moves to the next city, and he goes home and makes sure his McLaren has been washed. You know, it's just silly. It's, it's, it's all silliness. It's one of my favorite Justin Thomas quotes. When he won his first big event, someone asked him, you know, that's life-changing money. How does it feel? And he goes, well, I plan on making a lot of money in my career because if I want to win the things I want to win, I'm going to make money, so I don't really care. It's about the title that yeah. I just won my first PGA Tour win. And not everybody's like that. You know, for the guys on the Corn Ferry Tour fighting it out, to oh, get yeah. on the PGA Tour. The money's a big deal, but for those guys, it's just not. And that goes back to, I care more about Brooke winning the tournament more than I care about how much money she's making. Yeah, I think the big thing for Brooke Henderson uh, this week is the time, uh, the media requests. Agreed. And everything else makes it really tough, uh, especially to practice, you know, and to just be in a rhythm to tee off and rip it and then get focused over those putts and, you know, how many people are yelling her name in the crowd and she's having to smile at them and wave and then people who played with her and knew her when she was in school and happened to be there this week. And I mean, there's so much of that stuff in her life, right? Her little kids who are sick and they, they put in a letter to her and then they meet her by the side of one green to get a little moment with her. And there's so much of that when she's in Canada, it's going to be hard. You know, you, you referenced, we should talk about Gareth Rafluski, the, the PGA pro who's working with uh Co and he's working with the Jactanagarns and amazing PG of Canada a putting coach. Yeah, agreed. But you know the Brook things and it's an interesting argument with Brook because you and I happen to know Brook better than almost anybody who will do a podcast. Uh, you know we she grew up around us and uh, she's at our event every year we yeah. know the family and, and, and i played in events not obviously beside her because i'm older but adjacent to her since she was eight years old yeah so we know her well and you know this this the science thing like i'll give the example of the first clinic she did f four years ago at our, our charity event i asked her how stiff her driver was she says that's Brittany. i don't know and I, I thought that was kind of a funny little statement for someone at pga to or lpga tour level but She's that type of player. She just sees the ball, She's reacts feel. to it. She's yep. feel, 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 feel. This year at the uh, at our clinic, we had a couple hundred juniors there, and I asked her what loft was on her driver, and she said, I don't know, asked Brittany. Now, the loft is stamped on, on the, the bottom club. of the driver. So she probably went through the tour department at Ping, and it's a 10.34 you know, instead of 10.5, and, and maybe she was referring to that, but literally... 
She doesn't have a technical bone in her body. Agreed. Uh, they work on alignment a little bit. They work on a few things. But if she goes to a coach about her putting, you know, I think we've got to assume very much like Rory. By the way, it's an interesting week because very much like Rory, when Brooke's on, good luck, everybody. The winning by eight. She's done it. Rory has done it. And they both won this week. They're both these incredible instinctive athletes who can do things that no one else can do. But very similarly to Brooke, the, the, the wedge play in the putting sometimes for Rory has been a bit of a challenge. Right? Well, Rory statistically has improved his putting massively, and it was after he got the advice to stop thinking so mechanically about his stroke and let From Brad the putter flow. Yeah, he actually was right. – he went to a coach to say, don't worry about technical stuff. Yes. So that's interesting. Although, you know, there's a bit obvious – There's a fine a, line there, though, right? Just – I agree with you on the Brooke point. If Jeez. Brad Faxon, if Brad Faxon sees something wrong with his stroke, he's giving him some advice. I think he's saying, you know, the advice is don't be so analytical and scientific over the golf ball. You have to react to what you see. Agreed. Brooke does that. It's not the greatest stroke I've ever seen. She's always going to be streaky unless she straightens that away. But sometimes when you chase science, you give up instinct, right? And so I don't know that she should do it. I mean... People would probably expect me as a 30-year golf teacher and coach to say, definitely she should improve this and this in her putting stroke. But, you know, sometimes the magic just happens. And when it's happening with her, she makes the putts anyway and, and wins by a handful. So Sure. I, I think she sh However, I'll take the coach side. I think the putting is something she should work on. I agree with you on her ball striking because there are mechanical things even though she is a, an incredible athlete that makes it work, that you could change and make her even more efficient on her golf swing. But with the way she swings and the way it works for her, you'd never want to change that as a golf coach. You understand mm -hmm. at this point that that's her swing. It works for her. Don't mess with what works in her case is perfection, right? But I do think on the putting, if she cleaned things up, it would be better. She misses too many short ones. And the only problem with her case is if she's not – if you're right, when she's streaky and she's doing it right, it's brilliant. She's probably given up wins at this point because it wasn't streaking at the right moment. Mm -hmm. And you want to maximize your potential in your career. Yeah. You're right. You never know what could happen. You could overdo it. But I don't think it would incre involve incredibly Justin Rose. technical things. Look at Justin Rose. He putted incredibly well this year. I'm not saying the putting, but he didn't have a very good year. He switched. He started doing a bunch of TV ads. He switched clothing companies. He switched equipment companies. He switched everything. And it didn't really work for him. And he had I, an okay year, but... Uh, he almost won the U.S. Open because he single-handedly out-putted everybody. But anyway, um, it's a tough one, isn't it? And you don't want Brooke to be Lydia Ko, right? Talking about Justin Rose, just maybe think about Lydia Ko. She's had several caddies and equipment changes and all several. these things. My God. I know. And she's uh, clearly not the player she was at one point, at least. We don't know if she'll ever get back to it. But, you know, you don't want that to happen to Brooke. I just think at the same time, there's one very clear area she could clean it up. And she's so talented and so fun to watch. Yeah. That you'd love to see that get a little bit better. Even just through practice, maybe it won't be major mechanical change, but as she matures as a player, maybe that gets better. And I think you're right, her potential is My God, I love the way she drives the golf ball. Let's get to our topic today. So let's get to driving the ball. Rory, it's majestic is the word. You know, it's majestic. It's It looks almost like a Greek god when he's in balance yeah. and hits that ball. And Brooke... When she picks up that tee quickly, I just love that so much. It's like incredible confidence. Uh, you know, people have asked her, "Do you do you do you know where the ball's going?" But you know, as a as a good player, you know, certainly not a Brooke Henderson, but as a good player, has always been a pretty good driver of the golf ball. You feel impact. Your body's in a certain position. You feel the squareness of the hit. You hear the sound. You know it's going where you're trying to put it, and you just pick your tee up and move on. But she she snatches that T. It's like she's like she does it with authority almost. Yeah. It's a neat it's really her trademark now, I think. And uh her, her swing is just so strong. I mean, we're mesmerized. It she's like David Copperfield, right? It, it's distraction. Everybody thinks the the long club and the arms and the club head going back so far is the secret, but it has nothing to do with that. Um I mean, the size of her arc is a little longer because she's so flexible and gets into that position. But her foundation is so good. I mean, it, I want people to watch her her legs when she winds up. Her legs are stable and level 
and flexed and athletic. Uh, it, there's not a lot of movement in that golf swing. We're, we're, we're all watching the club head. Like, that's the distraction of the magician, right? We're watching that head and say, oh, everything's moving around. Look at the club. Wow, look where she is. But if you look at her lower body, stabilizing her, it's magnificent. And her flexibility, Jake. I mean... Well, that's where the real secret lies, isn't it? Well, it's a mix of flexibility and strength and to recover from the flexible position. You're right. I mean, the, the club is really misleading. Her, her body mechanics, kinematically, are incredibly, incredibly good. And simple. L and look simple. at her knees. Look at her hips. Agreed. She doesn't have any tilt. She doesn't have any slide. She just does what you're supposed to do, which is coil into that back leg, wind up your body keep the lower body pretty level as you load into that back leg, and then she just unwinds out of it. Absolutely, and you're right, because she turns more and she's so flexible. The distraction of the club comes into play because that extra turn she has makes the club swing around her longer. Yeah. But it, it is a brilliant show of if you use efficient body motion with a little bit of flexibility, a little bit of strength, how efficient you can hit the golf ball despite club position. You know, sometimes. it almost, though... It's almost a, a negative to us, right, as teachers, because people look at that club head and they go, well, she does it. Yes. Like, I've been hearing it about John Daly and Bubba now for two decades, right? Uh, how come he can hit it so far? Because no one who puts the club in that position does it with the same amount of flexible strength that Brooke does. And that's one of the great things I want to tell everybody listening, that you are not as flexible as anyone on the PGA Tour or the LPGA Tour. Not even close. I mean, they're in the gym three hours a day. Th they've swung a billion times, so their body just goes into those positions, right? And when, when you leave work and jump in your car and go hit 20 balls and tee off, if your shoulder turn is as big as Brooks, if your club head's getting past parallel, you're out of position. Because uh, unless you really, really work at it from a strength and flexibility perspective, you can't get there. Yeah, so, so, so to, to dive in that for a second, right, that secret is the X factor. So the reason why everyone's at a position, just for, for context, is because Brooke is able to turn her shoulders, let's say 120, 125 degrees, while only turning her hips 40 degrees. So there's a separation between her chest and her hips of, at those numbers, 85 degrees. It's a staggering differential you don't have the flexibility to turn your chest that much more in relation to your hips. If you're questioning that, stand up right now and try. Put your hands on your shoulders, try to turn your chest 120 degrees, and have your hips only turn 30. You're not going to be able to do it. I know I can't. So in a golf swing, if your chest turned, your hips must have over-rotated with them, and yeah. the weight probably shifted into the wrong part of your feet. The pressure is now in the wrong part of your back foot, and for most people, that's on the outside, and then good luck getting back down to the ball. Yeah. So one of the secrets to good driving is don't go back more than you can. There's right? a right swing for everybody, right? Brooks Kepka and Rory McIlroy are a perfect example of that because at the PGA Championship, they measured Rory's rotational, or rotation, I should say, with his hips, and they measured Brooks. And Rory, between the backswing turning a little more in the hip because he's a little more flexible, and the downswing turning through the ball more with speed, he has 60 degrees more rotation in his hips than Brooks Kepka does. They hit the ball a very incredibly similar distance. They're different body types, mm -hmm. right? They do it ways. different ways. And that means that if you're Brooks and you have a more conventionally turning length swing, if you're Rory or Brook and can turn more athletically than more people due to fle strength flexibility, or you're Tony Fino. And a more condensed swing that's more efficient allows him to rotate through the golf ball the best way he can. You can still drive the ball far. It's not about how long you swing. It's about how wide and torqued you are when you do it. Yeah, that's a very interesting comment. And, you know, Jake, I've been spending 30 years now trying to get people to maintain the integrity of the back leg. Uh, you turn your chest back as you swing your arms up. The weight flows, should flow to the back leg. Yes. The back leg has to accept but resist. That's what I tell people. The weight goes to the back. If your weight's staying on your front leg, you're in big trouble. The, you have to feel the weight going into that back leg, but that back leg has to maintain integrity, and it's like you say. It has to be, you know, the weight goes into the heel of the foot a little bit, but it's got to stay on the inside. So it's you the can, inside heel. You can, start, you can start the downswing with your legs and with your hips and, and get that club swinging on the proper path. And 
if your only goal is to watch how far the club head goes and you're willing to bend your arms, release the club in your hands, over rotate your spine, release the pressure in your back leg to, to get back farther, you're really destroying any ability to move forward. It's like a series of dominoes, right? So I think the first pe thing people have to understand about hitting better tee shots is maybe doing that little test you said, a little crisscross drill and how far can I go back? And you really need to understand that the most important thing about that top of backswing is you can unwind it from the ground up, right? It's, it winds up from the top, it unwinds from the bottom. And if the weight has traveled, if that back leg has straightened, if the hips have over-rotated trying to go back farther, if the weight's on the outside of the foot, it's almost impossible to hit good shots with the driver. You're going to, you're, you're going to unwind the upper body too quickly, throw the club out, you're going to cut across the ball, hit slices, which... I don't know what percentage of people listening would hit a slice. 70, if not more. A lot of people. Yeah. So ironically, the, the lesson from Brooke, I mean, she's got probably the biggest X factor in golf right now outside of long drive competitions. But the lesson you learn from her is you need to maintain the integrity of the lower body at the top of your backswing. And trying to make your backswing bigger will compromise your ability to unwind properly, get the club on the right path, get speed, get a square hit, and it'll destroy your driving. Agreed. Brooke's a perfect example of when a world-class athlete is able to do something that is the epitome of that benefit, right? She does it unlike anybody else. She's a brilliant case study for us as golf teachers to figure out how she's able to do it. Doesn't mean everybody should do it. Right, the same way that not everybody should try to do everything they see NHL players trying to do. You're just not able physically to do it. And and the other thing is you also don't need to do it. I mean, not to use myself as an example, but I drive the ball reasonably far. Right, I'm not a sh long hitter. I am not very flexible. I'm 5'10". I would say I'm mid-weight. You know, I'm not exactly ripped at the moment. And I only turn about 85 to 90 degrees in my backswing with a driver, which is... A little less than I would turn. ideally teach. Shoulder turn, yes, thank you. Which is a little less than I would ideally like to turn. I'm just, my body is not very flexible. And, you know, I'm not the longest driver I know by any means. I know people who hit it farther than me. But I'm second on our top tracer leaderboard for long drive at 397. You know, so. Yeah, you're a little out of, out of whack there when you say you're not that long. And you know a lot of people who drive it longer. No, you don't. You're 120 miles an hour of club head speed. And. There might be 20 others in the city who can do that. So don't undersell that a little bit. And it's a good lesson. You hit it with with power. You've got thick thighs, and you rotate through the ball quickly on the way down. It's the downswing speed. It's not the load. I always tell people, Jake, there are three ways to really increase speed, you know. Uh, and, and two of them are a little bit connected, but... It, the size of the arc is a biggie. So that doesn't just mean that... I mean, obviously, a guy who's taller than someone else can swing the club in a bigger circle. Yes. And if the club's moving a farther distance, you have the potential to hit it farther. Agreed. So a bigger arc with a wider takeaway is something you could work on for, for distance. Uh, hinging the wrists appropriately and really having your change of direction correct. So you almost like Brooke Henderson and Sergio and... Ben Hogan, you maintain lag longer so there's more speed with the hands and the and the arms down at the bottom is another way to gain some speed. But rotational speed, is to can. me, is the biggest. Yeah. How quickly can you move forward uh, with speed? And that's what you're, you're a master at. You're a short guy. You're stocky. Well, short, 5'10", I guess. You're stocky. You rotate the, through the ball incredibly quickly because you've got a strong body. And that's really what most people should be trying to do to hit the ball farther. Get yourself in the right position at the top. Maintain weight on the inside of that back leg. Don't try to overturn back, but then really work on your downswing sequence, doing it properly, which we'll, we're going to start talking about now. For sure. Uh, and do it quickly. Practice and practice and practice so you can do it as quick as you can. That's the real way to maximize distance, not trying to swing the club back farther. Agreed, and I also think Back it's to David Copperfield, right? Everybody's searching for the wrong thing. And I, I also think it's the best way to hit the ball straight, frankly. You know, if you think of golf as a racket sport like tennis or ping pong or badminton, 
you square up your racket in tennis by turning your body through and allowing the hands to square up at impact of the tennis racket. Well, the same is true in golf. Players like Dustin Johnson hit the ball so straight off the tee. I know he's not a great example this week because he didn't he hasn't been playing very well, but hit it so straight off the tee or Kepka because they rotate through the golf ball incredibly quickly and allow their hands to do as little as possible. They just rotate the club through the golf ball at the right angle, and the face stays incredibly square for a long time. And it's the way that Justin Thomas is and you know Rory and all of these players are able to hit these incredibly straight and incredibly long drives without looking like they're trying to murder the golf ball. Oh, they're ripping at it. <laughs> oh, clear. Justin Thomas, look, is, he, he looks like Barishnikov with the feet moving around. They wouldn't, He's trying to rip it. I just mean if you look at their tempo and their hitting, it doesn't look like they're giving it everything they got, right? They obviously could try harder. I would agree. But yeah, I don't know if I agree with Justin Thomas. He was not a good guy to use as an example there because he rips at it. Maybe him. not on the tempo, but of, of, I would stand by the swing statement, right? What keeps those guys hitting the ball so straight? I mean, Rory was m- number one off the tee in driving distance this week and third in fairways. You know, the number one thing that these guys are able to do is because they rotate so much through the golf ball, their hands don't have to flip to re-square the club at impact. They don't have to use their hands to do the job of their body. So well, no a- one has to ever. You should not do that. Anyway, we're getting a little off topic. We're starting to talk about these guys ripping it. And I, what I want to talk about is, you know, driving the ball better uh, and, and the secrets to it. So the one thing is not trying to turn back so far. Maintain the integrity in that back leg and really learn from Brooke, which might surprise people because they're all watching that club head. But find a swing of her on YouTube and slow-mo it to the top and look at her leg action. Look at how level her hips are. Look at how little her hips turn. Look at how flexed her legs are. Look at how stable her base is. It's a real secret to having a chance to swing down into the ball properly. So the real secret, Jake, to to, uh, driving is a square hit, right? The path of the club, which means the sequencing has to be correct. We wind from the top. We turn the chest back. The hips react. The club works around us. But the most important thing about your backswing, your top of backswing position, is you're in a position to allow for the correct downswing sequence. Agreed. Which starts from the ground, ankles, knees, hips, whatever you want to think about down there to get you moving into the golf ball properly. And when the lower body leads, the upper body holds off a little bit. The club works from the inside better. And then you start swinging on the proper path and hitting the ball squarely. And a square hit is more important than trying to have more club head speed. Uh, it's so important to say that to golfers. We can, we often fit people on the launch monitor, and they can slow down by a mile or two, but if they hit it more squarely, they'll hit it 25 yards farther. Yeah, many can slow down by more than that and hit it 25 yards farther. We're not saying swing soft, hit hard is a good idea, right? This whole idea of if I swing softer, I inherently hit harder is false. But what happens to most people is when they swing a little softer, the hit is more square, as you're getting at. And as I was, you know, getting at with the rotating through the Well, the sequence is correct, too, right? Not only... Exactly. That's where I'm going with this. So the sequencing gets better when you don't try to rip at it as hard because your body is more able to do what it's supposed to do. And that makes the club surprisingly sometimes go quicker. But again, rotating through the golf ball keeps the face predictable and the hit gets more square and the ball goes further. So... You're right. We don't want to just talk about the guys ripping it and turning through the golf ball, but I guess the point I was getting at was that it is also the way to hit it straight, is by letting your sequence unwind from the bottom properly and turning through the ball properly, you actually hit the ball straighter. It's not only a distance. Yeah, my only problem uh, with with the analogy is I don't want to make this about the guys hitting it 330. Agreed. I I want to teach people how to hit a golf ball. Fair, yeah. You know, so their discussion isn't that relevant. What Justin Thomas does with his feet is another distraction. I think trying to get up on your toes and having everything moving around. Couldn't agree more at that point. Let's not try to do what he does. Again, to go back to Brooke, you are not the athlete that some of these guys are, so don't try to do some of the things they do in their golf And gals. Yeah, I use guys as a general statement. But yes, the, the players we're talking about, you're not the same athlete as some of these players, so don't try to do that. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting too. Today's generation will get is a result of the equipment as well. If you tried to do what Justin Thomas does today when when I was younger, hitting a balada ball in a wood, you'd shoot 100. Yes, that's fair. You know, so I don't know if that's relevant to anything. That's the equipment everybody's hitting today. 
But I, I think that the ball goes pretty straight even when you rip at it as hard as you can because today's equipment enables you to cheat a little bit more. And I hate to tell all the slicers out there, but they'd slice more with 15-year-old equipment. They totally would. Because uh, spin rates, we see some amazing things on our, on our flight scope with, with spin rates today. With people, you know, if you adjust the weights in a head, and it, it's crazy how the equipment allows you to, to swing harder today. Anyway, yeah. that's off topic as well. So, so Jake, we get people at the top of their backswing. Turn the chest in posture as much as you can relative to that back leg. And then what do you like for a downswing thought? I mean, explain the downswing sequence to people. And what are your keys to getting into that golf ball properly? Well, as you were suggesting before, the proper thing to do dry, going through the golf ball or swinging down is to let your lower body initiate the motion. Most of us don't do that because most of us have the instinct to hit the ball. You're forgetting that the goal isn't the golf ball. The goal is the target. If you're trying so hard to hit down at the golf ball that you're staring at, that you wind up using your upper body too much and you throw that sequence off. So I think the most important thing for most golfers to keep in mind, especially with their driver that they want to hit harder, is something Rory said a bunch. When your tempo feels slow and transition, when you change direction slowly, slow it down again. Be patient in that change of direction because changing the direction of your swing from your backswing to your downswing quickly inherently makes you use your upper body more and throw off that kinematic sequence. It doesn't allow your legs to lead. It doesn't allow your arms to then follow and create that energy, that centrifugal force that gets increased due to the arms catching up yeah. to the lower body. Tempo and rhythm and transition is, is a real secret. You know, so we've said two things now. A lot of people destroy their ability to move forward because they sway or over-rotate, get the weight on the outside of their back legs, Absolutely. get out of position so they can't do it properly. And then even those who are in a pretty good position, if you're not understanding that the key is wind from the top, unwind from the bottom, and get the sequencing right, then you can't do it right. You can be in a perfect position at the top, but if you throw your arms and hands trying to hit down at that golf ball, you're again going to hit that big slice or get yourself in deep trouble, right? So uh, a solid foundation in the backswing, turning in posture as far as you can do, keeping the weight inside that back leg, not on the outside of it, getting yourself in a position to unwind properly, but then having the patience to unwind properly. One of my favorite little analogies I give people is, or one of our sayings here is it's where you're fa fast, not how fast you are, right? Absolutely, yeah. And the analogy I love is the, the sports car going into the corner. And you need to step on that accelerator at the apex of the turn to accelerate out of the corner. And if you step on the gas as you're entering the corner, you end up off the road. I use that quite often because I think it's a great analogy. When people turn the jets on at the top and just try to hit down at that ball, the sequence gets all out of whack and they end up crashing their car. Uh, when we hit, there's... I don't want to say there's a suspended moment when that club changes direction, but when I'm swinging my bat... I'd say it feels like it. I almost feel like there's a stop and a drop, right? And you allow that club to kind of change direction a little bit. To, to, you know, I don't get it every day, but when I do get it, I feel that club kind of drop a little bit and almost just suspend up there for a millisecond. It's when I hit my best shots. I also think that it's something that you have to work at is your tempo. People just inherently go, okay, well, I'll fix my tempo. You have to work at it to make it constant. And I also think it's something to understand the relationship between letting your legs lead and that dropping at the golf club. Because walking up and down a range for my entire life uh, or, or teaching tee, yeah. it is phenomenal how many people swing their club up to the top in a practice swing, and then they just pull their arms down, using that back elbow to pull the arm down, trying to get the club closer to their body and Force drop. Force it. You and can't it, force a natural sequence. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And I can tell from experience of being young and making that same mistake myself of I just wind up getting even steeper and, and throwing that sequence off even more because, again, I'm focusing on the wrong element. I'm focusing on my hands and what they're doing. It's very tempting to do that because you're holding the golf club. But if you allow your body to unwind as it's supposed to, which mimics other sports, right? It mimics the throwing of a football. It mimics stepping into a baseball to hit the ball hard. It's really just allowing your body to unwind athletically as if you were throwing a golf ball. It is a way cleaner, more efficient, and productive way to not only hit the ball farther but straighter. And yeah. in theory, that's the golden combination, right? 
not only uh, properly, but I, I'd also like, or in sequence properly, leading with the lower. But the lower body has to do the right thing too, Jake. Uh, many of the better players that we work with, the uh, competitive juniors, and they think Overdo throwing it. the legs yeah. at the at the Good target. Point. It's not about just leading with the lower body and throwing your legs. You have to do the right things in golf in the right sequence. The golf swing's like a cookie recipe, and you know you've got to put a little sugar in, and then you've got to put the eggs in and beat a little bit and then you got to you know whip this and then add a little bit of uh, vanilla and then you got to do a bit of this there's a sequence to it so it's not only doing the right thing in the right tempo but it's also in the right order right so we've talked a little bit about setting up in a good position we've talked about sequencing in the downswing the body has to move the right way too i know i know most of us who are good players even we fight that urge to hit it hard, and I tend to throw my arms, or I'm sorry, throw my legs too much at it. I drive laterally too much with my legs. My upper body falls back a little bit. The club actually gets under the proper path or the under the right path it's supposed to be on, and I fight a block and a hook, which is just as devastating as fighting a slice. Really good point, and some people even, you know, I've seen mid-handicap mid players come in and wind up on their back foot in their finish position, assuming they didn't get enough leg drive to just throw their legs even more. And what's ironically happening to them is they're throwing their legs and thrusting forward so much that they're having to throw their arms at it so aggressively and they wind up slicing. And that's where my problem more comes in. When my legs get aggressive, I tend yeah, to pull. Yeah, the upper body falls back. So they feel like they're not getting through it because they're feeling their head is way back, but they're actually getting through it too much. So they drive their legs more and they wind up having their head fall back even more and they never get off their back foot. Yeah. So that could be just as a problem. So to clarify how much you should drive your legs. So we use two terms in terms of your lower body movement. Sway is lateral movement from side to side. And thrust is movement towards or way of the golf ball. Take your pelvis, your hips. In the downswing, you should be a little bit behind the golf ball with your pelvis because you've turned into that Couple resisting of back leg. Right? So, an so inch let's and a give half the numbers. Uh, a typical PJ Tour player... You know, the, the the pelvic center, the belt buckle, will move back a couple of inches, and it'll rotate in towards the back leg an inch. You think an inch with a driver? It's point yeah, six. It's yeah. point six with a 7-iron about an inch. on our data. About, about an, inch. an inch. So that belt buckle, think about that, everybody. It turns back two inches and in an inch. That should tell you, too, your arms can't go back too far if you're not that flexible because that belt buckle or that pelvic center is only moving a couple inches back and an inch in. It's not moving a ton. You're not lifting or sliding or swaying. It's just a little bit of a rotation in, right? And the really important part is what you got at is the into your back leg, right? That's where the weight goes and a you're little bit into, into the back it. heel. Um, you don't want to thrust forward. That's a really bad way to drive a golf ball. I was talking to your uncle about that last night. Your uncle, John, who, you know, he played on the Canadian Tour, Australian Tour, he shot 62 in the Australian Open, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He, he sent me, so he and I, he played at Purdue. I played at Illinois, and uh, he was a great player. He won the Quebec Junior. He won the Quebec Amateur. 62 in player. the Australian Open is a pretty great goal. And uh, we were talking about that because his pelvic center, getting a little deep here for people, but his pelvic center is moving forward in his backswing. So his head moves a little forward, and I think he's out of balance, not letting the weight turn into his back leg enough. And so if the belt buckle moves forward towards the ball in the backswing, everything's going to react from there. And that's the discussion we had, and just something I wanted to add quickly. Yeah. Whatever you do wrong in your backswing, everybody, uh, it causes whatever happens in the downswing, which is some sort of a compensation to balance. So he was concerned that he was doing what we're saying, too much leg drive and coming out of posture and thrusting his his center through impact and hitting high hooks. But I, I was talking to him about the fact that I think it starts in his backswing because he's not turning into his back leg properly. That's another thing, by the way, on the flexibility topic to mention to people, work on your hip flexors and your hip because if your hip isn't flexible Huge. enough alone, you can't even turn into it properly, right. let alone with your chest amount. So I interrupted. So in the backswing, the pelvic center moves a couple inches back at about an inch in towards the yes. back hip. So And then what? On the downswing... The pelvic center should sway towards the golf or towards the target between four and six inches. Yeah, which sway, means sway is a word that makes people think about the backswing, but it, it bumps laterally, yeah. dead laterally. It's the word we use most of the time, yeah. right? So it bumps forward four to six inches, which means you should, your pelvis should be only, if you've moved an inch and a half or two inches going back, 
three to four and a half inches forward. Yeah. Which means the front part of your lead thigh shouldn't get in front of your ankle with the driver. If you have your dr- if you have your golf ball at your lead heel, you bump your hips forward. The hip should not pass your ankle. Yeah. When you've done that, you've overdone it. And so I think the number on our data, you know, goes back two inches and then forward to four point eight. So that would be a six point eight total move, max, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but think about how small six inches is. Like it might sound like a big thing, but it's not that much lateral move. No, anyway, not at all. Uh, explain the more important thing is so the rotation, right? It's how it leads to the thrust. So thrust, like we said, is moving at or towards or away from the golf ball with your pelvis. And when you over bump your hips, it is incredibly hard at that point to then turn enough going through the golf ball, right? Rory talks about how in the first part of his downswing, he wants to feel like his knee externally rotates or rotates forward and then away from the golf ball to clear his hips and allow him to rotate in a way that squares up the golf club. Yeah. When you bump forward too much, you can't also turn. You can only move your body so many ways at once. So you wind up thrusting into the golf ball. Your hips come forward. Is a better player. We should say, by the way, this is a better player problem. Usually. I fought this my entire career. Uh, most amateurs unwind in the wrong sequence. Most high handicappers unwind in the wrong sequence because they're in the bad position at the top. And so they the spin. arms, they spin. They yeah. have no thrust. Agreed. They just spin. However, it's something that they need to understand, too. Absolutely because, again, if we just talk about your leg bump and you keep trying to bump your legs, that's not going to work. So you need to rotate through the golf ball. If you do that properly, you should have no thrust. Most players, even pretty good players, have thrust going into the golf ball. I've and got an inch. When your pelvis thrusts forward, your posture angles change, and you early extend. Your hips come up, your back, your torso moves back, and you don't hit the ball as clean as you should. You don't rotate through the ball as cleanly as these guys yeah, on tour if people are, are hitting are, the ball If people are practicing the better players and their head feels like it falls back in their downswing, that is big trouble. Because the reason the head falls back is because the pelvis is going forward too much, right? Yes. It's not, your head won't fall back if you just move laterally and turn. So if you bump to the target and rotate onto your leg, it's really difficult for the head to fall backwards. The head normally falls backwards. If you're kind of thrusting forward, almost, almost, uh, you know, thrusting your belt buckle towards the ball a little bit or way out towards the target, then you'll arch your back and your head will fall back. And your only solution to not hitting it way right or thin or topping it is to flip your hands at the bottom and try to save it. Which is what we were getting at earlier about if you rotate better through the golf ball, you don't need that flip. And that's why it's also the good way to drive the ball straight. Yeah. So you need to make sure your hips turn through. I mean, one thing I do in my teaching a lot is I ask people questions so that they critically think. I'm not just spouting information at them, right? Love it. Why, where should you be at this point? Where should your chest point at the end of your golf swing? One thing I ask a lot is where should your hips be at impact? And most people go, well, they should be pointing at the golf ball. No, they shouldn't. Yeah, I know. They should be at least as turned through the golf ball as they were turned back. So an average tour pro has his hips rotated open to the target 45 degrees, which is a lot at impact. And that rotation, as we've been getting at this whole time, is how they get the distance, how they square the club up. And again, you can't do that properly if you bump your hips too much and thrust. So you need to make sure you have that bump. You need to to make sure you have that sway to drop the club onto plane and to get the club in position. But the real secret to better driving is in that rotation through the golf ball after you do that. Yeah. Because if you don't rotate, you're in just as much trouble. And again, you're going to be using your arms. You know, it's so interesting listening to us talk here and just thinking about it. And we're, we're talking about positional play and sequencing and what you want your body to do. We haven't mentioned swinging faster. And all people do out there is stand over it, grip it like Magilla Gorilla, and try to swing as fast as they can. That's fair. And 100% of our conversation today is about putting your body in the right positions in the right seat. It has nothing to do with, hey, if you want to hit it farther, try to swing faster. Like, it has nothing to do with that. No, the club is longer. <clears throat> the arc is wider because your stance is wider and the club is longer. And the faces are hot. So those things are going to make the ball go farther. Square it's impact. not your job to do it. Correct. Uh, we, we've said this before uh, on the show, but 
my body rotation is actually slower with a driver than it is with a 7-iron. Yes, because your stance is wider, so you can't have as much of that bump and turn as quickly. But again, that slightly slower body motion with the same basic mechanics with and a longer, a longer club, club yeah. make the ball go farther. It, it's it's really simple when you put it like that. But everybody thinks their driver swing needs to be totally different than their iron swing inherently because they're trying to do something different, which is hit the ball farther. And in reality, if you just do the same thing over and over and over, it's the most repeatable, but it's also the most efficient too. Yeah. And if you do these things properly, that's when you get someone like Rory or someone like Brooke, who, as you said at the start of you know, this discussion, just very simply wind their upper body against their lower body and then bump the appropriate amount to the target, allow the club to set, and then rotate through like nobody's business. And they but the rotate is later. This is the, the sports car in the, in the corner, right? Agreed. The, a let, the, the bump and the patience is required to do it. And if you have the athletic ability to put the turn as much in the backswing as they do and rotate as much through as they do, then go for it. You'll I think hit. one of the secrets to good driving is to really figure out that patience at the top. It was Rory's key thought. You know, if you can, uh, Ben Hogan even used to say, I go back to, you know, reading books as a kid. And sa he said, if I get the club to the right spot at waist high on the way down, I can hit it as hard. I can try to hit it as hard as I want. So that's interesting, right? You've got to get the club in the right position on the way down. You've got to get it in the right position at the top, and then the sequence has to be correct. Again, it's turning the jets on at the right time. Correct. The afterburners, right? You think of a, of a jet just flipping a switch. Yeah. That switch gets flipped halfway down. Or the nitro in your car example. That switch doesn't get flipped off at the starting line. It no. gets flipped at a certain point, right? Absolutely. And uh, in a sports car, it's at the apex of the turn. In a golf swing, it's when the hands are coming down past the ribs to waist high almost. At that point, once you've, you've turned into the back leg, you've kind of made the, the legs start the downswing, you can feel that club shape a little bit and change direction, then you can let it fly but, or hit that switch. But you can't hit it at the top. And you, you can't hit it farther by trying to go back farther. No, not if you're not able to. Right. Again, that's where examples of players more like myself come into play or even, you know, Brooks Kepka as a, at a more high level example. He doesn't turn as much as Rory because he can't turn as much as Rory, but he hits the ball far because it's the right distance for him. John Rahm, Gary Woodland. These are all examples of guys that have wide, powerful golf swings, but they don't necessarily look as long as the other players because they don't have quite as much rotation. Yeah. However, they do the right amount for them and they hit it far. Yeah, uh, there's lots of ways to hit it for speed of rotation coming down is what Brooks does. I mean, he he and and just mass. Uh, a nail will go further into a two by four if you hit it with a bigger hammer. So he's just a stronger, muscular guy. His twitch muscles, his mere force, is hitting the golf ball a little bit farther, which is, you know, an, another part of it, right? So there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, let's talk a little setup, and then I was going to say that. Let let's people go pray. We haven't even talked about setup, but I think setting your angles properly at the start uh, are so important. And and golf ball forward enough. I, I don't know why, but so many people I teach have that golf ball kind of under their heart with a driver. You need that ball. You want to hit on the upswing. You need the ball off the front heel. Yeah, I I do want to make a quick note on that too because in the Instagram age of people taping golf swings and putting them all over the place. Uh, Brooks Kepka is all over Instagram with his swing. And in a lot of his shots, he is, does not have the golf ball up on his lead heel. And I don't want people to get misled by that. So very quickly, some of the players put the golf ball a little farther back than would be optimal for you. You're not going to see that in the LPGA Tour, and your swing is more the speed of an LPGA Tour player. So you should be copying them, not the Tour Pros anyways. But the reason they do that is because if you put the golf ball slightly back in your stance, number one, it helps you hit it lower. They might be in a windy hole that time, and they're trying to flight the ball down, almost hitting a stinger driver. Yep. But the other thing it does is it makes the ball closer to the low point of your swing. Right? If the low point of the swing is behind your lead foot, if you put the golf ball there a little more, you're, mac you're meeting your low point. And for a lot of these players who do not want to hook the golf ball, they hit the ball more level, less up, when they put the golf ball there. So their attack angle, instead of being three up, which would be ideal, is about zero, zero, or maybe half a degree up or half a degree down. And that protects them from the hook. If you are not a dry golfer that needs to protect yourself against the hook, which is 90% of golfers, 
you shouldn't be doing that. You want yeah. the golf ball as forward as possible. Okay, LPGA Tour on average hit it three degrees on the way up. Yes. Which is where we'd teach everybody listening it's to this. It's where most golfers should be. And for the record, PGA Rory Tours are does close to too. netting out, right? PGA yes. Tour pros, they do not want to hit that hook. They need to keep the ball in play and moving that ball back and teeing it a little lower. You know, it's easier to cut the ball. It's easier to, 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 to manage the golf ball. I, I would use Rory as the example of the guy who still swings up on it like crazy. And Agreed. Rory's not doing that. Rory has his ball teed up forward to hit it up in the air, and you R should too. I just wanted to address that because people sometimes get confused when they see stuff online. Yeah, so right? front heel. Uh, the other thing I, I like a lot over a, a driver is the ha keep the hands centered. Keep the hands just in front of your belt buckle or just left really of it. that's a important one, yeah. Because a lot of people, when the ball moves forward, then they open up their upper bodies and they push their arms forward. And that's a really good way to cut across there. the ball more. Yeah, it's not a good thing. So keep your hands just just forward of your belt buckle uh, back. And it's okay if your club head starts five inches behind the ball. You don't have to put your club head right at the ball. Uh, you're going to get to it at an impact position. Uh, but keep the hands back a little bit. Make sure your, your forearms are nice and square over the golf ball. And then the other thing that's super important is the, the spine tilt. Yes. So spine angle in golf uh, is how much you bend forward, right? You pull the hips back and you, you address the golf ball bending forward. Spine tilt is the side-to-side -side view of it. So you, you want to tilt a little bit more away from the target with your upper spine. So with a 7-iron, you've got about 2 degrees of tilt. You're almost, well, with a putter, we'd say your spine's up and down, 90-degree angle to the yes. ground, right? With a 7-iron, you want about 2 degrees of tilt. With a driver, you want 5 to 7. So you want that lead ear away from the target. Again, that will encourage an upward swing on the golf ball. Absolutely, because you're farther behind. launch it in the air. Farther behind the ball. And many people go, oh, I feel so far behind the ball when I do this. But that's the point. You're supposed to be angled more behind the golf ball because, as you said, that helps you hit up on the ball, which for most golfers at most players' speed, you need to do. Because a big secret to hitting a driver far is optimizing that launch angle. And I bet you with your driver's speed, it's higher than you think it needs to be. Yeah. You need more flight than you need roll. And the only way to do that for most people is to hit it on the upswing. Ball forward, hands back, more spine tilt. Don't widen your stance too much. This is another thing I see the, the Freddie Flintstone McGilla Gorilla set up where it gets so wide they can't turn at all. We talked yeah. about how the pelvis has to work in golf. I'm looking at Rory behind me, and you know the instep of his foot is about the width of his shoulders. It's not much wider than that. And I think if you get much wider than that, that that's where it starts to become a problem. Yeah, uh, I see a lot of bigger guys with that testosterone you know they want to get really wide and stable so they can really rip at it but if your feet are too wide you inhibit rotation and you cannot uh clear and rotate through the ball properly so not too too wide right we don't want yes. too too wide I, I think jake in closing you know we go on all day but unfortunately we have lessons to go teach yeah we do i, I would love people to work on path into the ball and squareness of hit i mean half swings with a driver is something I never see anyone do. I, I can't tell you how many times. We've got power tee here at the golf center, which is fantastic because it automatically tees the balls up. But I'll put a person in over a golf ball. I'll pull their, their trailing leg back off the line, so close their, their foot stance. Yes. So it encourages them to turn in and hit from the inside. And I'll have them hit little, well, I wouldn't say a half swing. They swing their, their, their fists up to their ribs probably, so a little... 65 percent swing and just try to hit the inside of the ball on the way up off the tee so you know your path is from the inside you're swinging up on the ball and popping it up in the air by pulling that trailing foot off the line you're turning into your backswing a little more and then swinging up without that that foot on the line with that closed foot stance it's m harder to be aggressive from the top too because there's no leg there to support you so it really encourages an inside path into the ball and just popping up in the air. I can get a person from slicing to hitting a little draw in five minutes doing this. And you may say, wow, that's nothing. But five minutes, you hit a ball every five or eight seconds. It's a lot of balls. Five minutes is 40 balls, right? You're, you're, you're hitting those golf balls and hitting them. and As Just cutter, getting used to what it feels like, the club coming from inside and up. As a more cut fade golfer, I've used it a lot, and it's an incredibly useful drill. Half swings, figuring out a square hit. Um, you know, improving smash factor. Smash factor is that 
that stat, which is the difference between the club head speed and the ball speed, you want to hit square shots. You need the club to be on the right path. You need it to be moving the right way and, and hit the ball squarely to hit it farther. And that whole concept of moving around more, having a bigger backswing and trying to swing faster, it, it's an epidemic in golf. I mean, it, it, it's a big, big, big problem. Uh, work on your setups. Get behind the ball more. Work on that stable lower body, making sure the weight's in the right place at the top. Allow some patience at the top, and then you're just thinking about hitting it from the inside and, and, and you know, hitting the ball a little on the upswing. And you can revolutionize your golf game. I, I always tell my, my clinic people that the driver's 25% of the game. If you can get the ball in play, you look at Rory, if you can get the ball in play, strokes gained off the tee, he leads and he's you know, probably my player of the year, going back to our conversation. Yeah, when your in the first show. stroke, when your first you gotta get in off the driving tee. distance, but third in accuracy, I mean, good luck. But take some lessons and work on positions and work on path. Don't just try to swing faster or go by another driver. Totally You've agree. got to change the way your club is traveling into that golf ball. And if you're going to get a driver, get fit for it. But we've talked about that on the show already. So we'll leave that for another